Okay, I'll start. So today's lecture is about um, motivic periods. Um, and it will be entirely mathematical. <clears throat> uh, so classically, um, the way to think about periods are um, coefficients in um, the Durham isomorphism. So let me explain what that means. We have uh, two functors. Two cohomology uh, theories. Which, is called, uh, which are called Betty or Durham. Um, B or DR, which go from the category of smooth schemes. with algebraic varieties over Q, if you like, to the category of finite dimensional vector spaces over Q. Okay, so let's explain what these are. Um, so Betty um, cohomology is also known as singular cohomology, as we learn about in algebraic topology courses. <clears throat> so the ith Betty cohomology of x will be defined to be the ith singular cohomology group of the complex points of x. So the complex points of x is a, um, a smooth manifold, so we can take its cohomology with coefficients in q. This is singular cohomology. It's constructed out of um, singular co-chains. And then we have algebraic Durham cohomology, which was defined by Kottendieck. Um, so the general definition is that the ith Durham cohomology group is defined to be the hypercohomology of x with coefficients in the sheaf of regular differential forms on x. So this is cotton -Dieck. Um In all the cases we'll look at today, um, x will be affine, in which case this simplifies enormously, and the Durham cohomology is the, the naive thing. So it, it's, it's uh, uh, closed forms, modulo exact forms, except instead of working with smooth C-infinity forms, we work with algebraic forms. And the, the miracle is that it actually gives the correct answer. So it's the cohomology of the following complex um, So D is the usual differential of dif differential forms. Um, so omega dot xq here denotes um, the uh, complex of global uh, regular uh, algebraic differential forms which are defined over Q. I'll give an example in a minute. Um, so we have two different cohomology theories, and they can be compared by integration. So this is the comparison map. Um, so it's comp BDR which goes from the ith Durham cohomology group of x 
tensored with C because um, periods are complex numbers in general. So this is an isomorphism. And what is the map? The map is integration. So we take a differential form omega and we, um, sorry. And to every homology class, sigma, we assign the integral of omega over sigma. So how do we think of how to make sense of this? Well, sigma here is an element of the dual of the Betti cohomology. And because we have Q coefficients, this is HOM HI Betti X Q. And this is just the usual singular homology of our space, a singular homology. So a chain of integration. So a period is a certain type of number obtained by integrating an algebraic differential form over some appropriate chain of integration. <coughs> so here's an example. So I like to call, to call this the Lefschetz motive. <coughs> so x here will be um, the projective line over q minus zero infinity. So it's, um, it's the, the punctured Riemann sphere in two points, and so its complex points is just C star, C minus the origin. <clears throat> and so omega naught xq is just the uh, regular functions on x, O of x, and the regular functions on this are just polynomials in x and 1 over x. <coughs> and then omega 1, xq, are just one form, so it's the same thing times dx. So what is this complex? It's um, 0 O of x d um, omega 1 x. <coughs> so this is um, q of x 1 over x, q of x 1 over x dx. So what is um, H naught? H naught are um, things in the kernel of this map. Um, so polynomials with zero differential, and they're just the constants. And what is H1? It's the co-kernel, so it's the, the elements, um, the one forms which cannot be written as D of something. And as we all know, um, the only element in this ring that is not an exact differential is uh, dx over x. So h1 Duram, so this is Duram here, is isomorphic to q dx over x. As we learned in high school that dx over x has a primitive which is called the logarithm and that is not an algebraic function. Okay, so now for homology. Um, so the punctured um, complex plane is homotopy equivalent to a circle. And so that means that um, the Betti uh, homology is again isomorphic to Q, it's connected. And H1 of X is mapped by the class of gamma naught where um, Gamma naught is some path winding around the origin. So let's put infinity in as well. Okay, so what are what is the uh, the period? There's only one period. 
So of course, as, as predicted, as expected, the, um, the Duram and the Betty spaces are both one-dimensional. They need to be isomorphic after tensoring with C, so they better have the same dimension. So the period of H1 is um, obtained by integrating in, in this isomorphism, you integrate over gamma naught the differential form dx over x. And this is equivalent to Cauchy's theorem, which states that it's 2 pi i, 2 i pi. Ah. OK, so we need um, something more complicated, slightly more complicated, which is relative cohomology. So it's the cohomology of something modulo something else, if you like. Yeah. Sorry, what is? I mean, I understand what, I understand what you wrote, but what exactly is period here? Period. So it, you have a, um, uh, a period is, is where you take uh, an element in, um, in Duram, which is a Q vector space, and then you take an element which is in, in the dual of Betty, which is a Q vector space, and this comparison map will, um, will allow, enable you to pair them together, but only over C. So it will produce a, a complex number. If you like, write a, write a basis of this vector space, write a basis of that vector space, and write this linear map in a mat as a matrix in that basis. No, a period is an element of the matrix that, it, that expresses this linear map. So a linear map can be written as a matrix, and uh, it has complex coefficients. But then you can normalize it arbitrarily, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I di didn't say uh, I didn't say how to choose a basis. That's not there's no the canonical basis. basis is change of basis is rational because they're rational yeah. vector spaces. Uh, exactly. So uh, here I could take I could take three times omega and sixteen times uh, gamma naught. So I'll, I'll end up multiplying the, the the periods. The ring of periods will be two i i pi times rational numbers, if I change the basis. We'll, we'll see uh, an, uh, some more interesting examples in a minute. So now I'll let, I had take two spaces, Z contained in X. Um, I'll be slightly dishonest. Um, let's assume that they're smooth for now. But in the examples, um, uh, Z will not be smooth, it will be a Simple normal crossing divisor in X, but let's. No, but so, so sorry, sorry for disturbing you. Yes, sure but uh, okay, in general, in general periods will be a matrix, right? I'm sorry. There'll, there'll be a period matrix, yeah. and and an element in this matrix. If you look at the the vector space spanned by the elements of the matrix, will form a ring. That's a ring of periods. Okay. Of that situation. So any such element can be written as linear combinations of integrals. Um, so, uh, relative cohomology is something that sits in a um, long exact sequence So here, this applies for both Betty and Durham cohomology. Um, so I don't want to spend a long time defining this. Um, I'll just say that the elements in relative homology are um, not represented by chains anymore. but um, represented by chains in X, C, singular, singular chains, whose, boundary, whose boundaries are contained in Z. Um, so in the previous example, the, the chain of integration, gamma naught had no boundary. Um, but we need things with boundary, and that's what forces us to look at relative, relative cohomology. 
And um, for Durham, it's, it's uh, defined in a similar way. One way to think about the relative Durham form is um, a, a differential form on x whose restriction to z uh, vanishes, for example. It's a bit more complicated than that. But that will be enough for all the examples we need in this entire course. So uh, in, again, there's a uh, comparison isomorphism similar to before. Um, which goes from relative uh, cohomology tensored with C to Betty cohomology tensored with C in much the same way. And um, we're going to look at a, a, a very special case. So suppose that the dimension of x is n, and so dimension of z, let's say, is n minus 1. Then um, any algebraic um, and let's take x affine. So any uh, um, algebraic n form um, omega um, because it's an n form then automatically its restriction to z will vanish and furthermore it will automatically be closed um, so in fact we can just take any form of top degree and um, you can check that the differential form omega um, defines a class in H relative cohomology. Um, and, and now we can take any uh, sigma, a chain contained, so a topological singular chain um, whose boundary delta of sigma is contained in the subspace. Um, and so that then defines a relative homology class. Um, So an element in the dual, a function on relative cohomology, and the period, the period of this of this pair of data, the differential form and the psych and the, the chain, is the integral of omega along sigma. So the the, the relative this relative business is just um, to take account of the fact that we need chains of integration uh, which have non-trivial boundaries. So example, um, oh yeah, so same as before, x is p1 minus 0 infinity, and z is just a pair of points, 1 and alpha, where alpha is a rational number, and let's say bigger than 1. Um, then um, from, from this long exact sequence, it's, a, it's a, a very straightforward calculation to check that the Durham cohomology is two-dimensional now. So I'll spare you the details. Um, there is the differential form we had before. and the class of dx. So dx viewed as a differential form just on x, not relative to z, is of course exact. But as a relative form, it is, um, it is not exact. 
Um, so likewise, what's um, the Betty homology, relative Betty homology, again has now is two dimensional. So there's the class of gamma naught, and that would be gamma one. So if we have zero here and infinity out here and one, then gamma naught is a path, a loop around zero. And gamma one will just be the, the straight path from one to alpha. So these are indeed relative homology classes. The boundary of gamma naught is trivial, so it's certainly contained in the points one and alpha. But the, the boundary of gamma one is clearly contained in the two points one and alpha, which is in Z. So gamma one indeed defines a um, homology class, and these form a basis. So now the, the period matrix, which I hope answers the previous question. Uh, we take this basis, we could choose another one if we wanted to, and we um, compute all the integrals. So, um, we integrate dx over gamma naught and gamma 1, and dx over x over gamma naught and gamma 1 likewise. And at this point, to make the answer um, cleaner, actually I'm going to rescale this to be, I'm going to divide by alpha minus 1 to get a nicer answer. I'm allowed to do that. And so the, the integral of, of dx um, along this path is the integral is just uh, alpha minus 1, but I've divided by alpha minus 1 precisely to make this number 1. Um, the integral of dx around a closed loop um, by Stokes' formula is just 0, because the loop has no boundary. Then the integral of dx over x um, from 1 to alpha is, is the logarithm of alpha minus the logarithm of 1, which is the logarithm of alpha. And finally, the integral of dx over x around gamma naught, well, we already did that. That's 2i pi. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right, so the, the next example, I'm, I'm going to try to interpret um, zeta of 2 as a period in this language. The example is due to Gonshov and Manin, and it's a very, very nice example because it illustrates a lot of um, the phenomena that are going to come up again and again in the context of Feynman integrals. So I'll, I'll try to spend some time on this example because it's crucial to understand it in, uh, in some detail. By the way, can yeah. I understand correctly? So pi is not the period, only i pi? Uh, pi, is a, pi is a period as well. You can, uh, you can cook up an example. Yeah. Um, all, all algebraic numbers are periods, and uh, so you can multiply by i. And periods form a ring, so if you write i as a period, you multiply 2i pi by i, and you get 2 pi, minus 2 pi. So here's um, an example. Um, I may have to cut the example in two if I run out of time. OK, so we want to interpret the following number as a period. So zeta 2 is the integral um, so this integral, so to check that this is zeta 2, I think for physicists this is very trivial. You uh, just do a um, a expand 1 over 1 minus t1 as a geometric series and, and you just 
um, integrate, you just do the integral, it's very easy. So you, you'll, you'll find sum over 1 n squared. Um, in fact, this integral goes all the way back to Leibniz. So this is the prototype for um, all the integrals we'll see in all the Feynman integrals. Okay, so what we want to do is to interpret this geometrically. Um, so the differential form, um, what we want to do is want to view this as a pairing between um, a Duram cohomology class, a differential form, and some relative cycle. So we want to take um, x as a first approximation to be affine two space and we need to remove the, bar the singularities of the differential form otherwise it won't be defined on that space. So we have t2 equals naught and um, t1 equals 1. Um, And the domain of integration um, is going to be the domain of integration is going to be um, okay. So not yet. First of all, the differential form omega is dt1 over one minus t1 dt2 over t2 which is indeed a regular global differential form on this space x. So that looks good. Um, but the domain of integration sigma is the domain is given by the set of points t1, t2, where this inequality holds. So it's this region, it's this region here. And where is its boundary contained in? What well, is boundary is contained in the, the the three white lines, which are which is t1 equals naught um, union t1 equals t2 union t2 equals one um, intersected with x. And this is where the problem, problem lies. Because the, the problem is the following, is that when we, when we remove the red lines from this space, we uh, remove uh, two extra points which are actually in the boundary of the domain of integration. Um, so the problem is then that sigma does not define a relative homology class. And this will be the case in all the interesting examples. You always find this phenomenon. In fact, there are good reasons why every time you have a, a period that's arithmetically sort of interesting, this type of phenomenon happens. And it happens in abundance in, in physics. Um, and the problem is that the point zero, zero, and 1, 1 are both in um, the, uh, the closure of the boundary of the domain of integration. But the point 0, 0 and 1, 1 are not, in fact, in the space x. So in some sense, when you remove uh, the red lines, you throw out the baby with the bathwater and you lose your chain of integration <coughs> because you've just deleted two of the points in the corner. So what is the solution? Uh, so the solution is to um, what mathematicians call the blow up. And um, in physics, um, the, the, word, the relevant words would be, I guess, hep, hep sectors sort of does the same job in quantum field theory. 
Um, so you want to blow up the points 0, 0 and 1, 1. What is the name physicists give to, to this? Um, in the case of the Feynman diagram, the HEP sectors. HEP, H-E -E, class HEP. So we'll do next time. I'll, I'll do the compactification in great detail. I'm um, in the case of Feynman integrals, and it should be very familiar to people who know the old physics literature. Um, so blow up zero zero one one. What does that mean? It means that you replace each of these points with a copy of the projective line. Sorry, that should be in. Yeah, that's okay. It's white. So this is the new space. Um, so we get a new space that I'll call A for now, in which we've added, replaced the two points by, by P1s. This is called the blow up. Oh, let me label, sorry, let me label these. Um, these divisors once and for all, R1, R2, let's call this B1, B2, B3, and these are called exceptional divisors, epsilon 1, epsilon 2. Uh, this is a real blow up or a, a complex blow up? This is complex blow up, but I'm drawing the real points. Circle or you have uh, or or the two opposite points of this? No, it's the, it's the complex blow up. Okay. Yeah. But of course, I can only draw a real picture. Yeah. <laughs> but had I drawn the real, I, I would have identified the opposite if it had been. Okay, so the inverse image, so now we just think of this as a change of variables on the integral. So the inverse image of sigma now is the shaded pentagon um, with boundary contained in now five divisors, not, not three. So B is the union of B1, B2, B3, Epsilon 2. And when you pull back the differential form up to A, we have to check, and I'll do one of the cases in a minute, that it has no poles. So what can happen is it can acquire poles along the exceptional divisors, but it doesn't. We have to check that. And this is in omega 2 of A minus R1 in R2. And so what this means is that this integral, um, so also I should say that these are now simple normal crossing divisors. And um, um, so what we get is that zeta, we now write our integral zeta 2 by change of variables as pi inverse of sigma, pi upper star omega. So this seems like total nitpicking, but it's, it's very important because it now expresses this number as a period of a certain relative homology, a uh, cohomology group. So the, the, the pi upper star omega has singularities, um, uh, sorry, singularities in R. So minus, and then we take relative to B, So what that means is that, as before, this differential form so means that pi star omega is in the Duram cohomology of this relative thing, and pi inverse sigma, which is this pentagon, is indeed now uh, a relative homology class. So zeta 2 is the pairing between the two. OK, so that's the, the crucial example. So I'll now um, explain how to do the blow-ups using um, explicit coordinates. Because uh, next week there'll be lots of blow-ups, so I, I want this to, example to be quite familiar. So in, let's just blow up the, the, uh, the, the origin. So in the neighborhood of the origin, <coughs> we change coordinates and put x equals t1 over t2 and y equals t2. 
so what that does is in, in the T1, so we're looking at, in the T1, T2 plane, we have these, uh, this, this, sort of, this sort of sector um, near the bottom left-hand corner, and it's going to correspond to, in the XY plane, it's going to correspond to uh, this picture. So x equals 1. This is t1 equals t2. This is the piece of the exceptional divisor, and this is t1 equals naught. And you, you see that the, what was previously a point here corresponds to an entire line in the new coordinates. And so let's just check that the, that the differential form let's compute what happens to the differential form. So we started off with um, so the epsilon 1 in these coordinates is given by y equals naught. And the differential form omega is dt1 over 1 minus t1 d2 over t2. And if you do the change of variables, um, you get dx dy over 1 minus xy. So it's a simple exercise. And we notice that in the new coordinates, there is indeed no singularity at y equals naught. So it has no pole. Y equals none. So this seems um, very pedantic, but it's crucial because all um, the information, all the qualitative information about the number zeta 2, about the period, is contained in this uh, infinitesimal data of what's happening in the corners. And um, it's that data that, um, that will govern this. Um, it's, it's sort of Galois conjugates. And so we have to study this in great detail in the physics situation. Um, so perhaps I'll give, I'll give the, the, the general, the um, I'll give the general coordinates, a full set of coordinates on this, on this blown up space because it's recently, it's something I did a long time ago, but it's recently become of, um, has had several different applications in parts of physics in um, Supiang mills theory, for example. And I, I think it may be of interest to, to physicists. So let me do this example um, and explain how to write down coordinates on the whole space. And the general case I may postpone to the end um, if I have time. So um, let's write down the coordinates on A. So we can write down U13. We can do these two blow ups simultaneously by choosing coordinates in a nice way. Um, and in fact, this um, picture has a has a symmetry acting a symmetry group acting on it, and these coordinates are chosen in such a way that they're completely symmetric with respect to that symmetry. It's a dihedral symmetry of order ten, a dihedral group of order ten. Okay, so we have. Um, these coordinates will do the job of blowing up the origin, um, which was what we did before with these, just looking at these two coordinates. But uh, the other ones will also blow up the corner 1, 1 for you. And what you have in U, U state 5? Yes. Is it T2 minus T1 and T1 minus T2? No, it's absolutely. Thank you very much. I've miscopied. Yeah, because that would cancel. <laughs> Thank you. OK, I need to wake up. Um, so we get um, on so the space A, so these equations satisfy, these coordinates satisfy certain equations. And if I've done it right, we get equations like this. And the and we get five equations obtained by cyclically permuting the indices. 
So incidentally, these are, this is a cluster variety in this particular case, but it's not in general. <coughs> um, and we set A to be the variety defined by the solutions. I mean, the points of this variety are solutions to these equations. Um, so it's the spec of Z U I J modulo these equations. So this space I call M05 delta. It's a partial compactification of the moduli space of Riemann spheres with five marked points. And on it, there are divisors dij defined by the vanishing of these special coordinates, uij equals naught. And they form a pentagon. So these coordinates are chosen in such a way that they vanish exactly then one-to-one -one correspondence with this the components of the boundary and they vanish precisely on each um, and um, and so the the cohomology we're looking at is h2 m05 delta relative to D, where D is a union of the Dij. So this uh, generalizes in a very straightforward way. Um, and enables you, so you can play the same game, and express all the multiple zeta values. So zeta n1 up to nr, which I defined last time. So these can be written as uh, integrals over simplices <coughs> so n is the sum of the arguments, also known as the weight. <coughs> and it can be written as an iterated integral Et n, where the epsilons are, are the sequence one, zero. So zero to the power of something is a notation to mean a sequence of of so many zeros, then followed by one, then another batch of zeros, one, naught, and r minus one. So um, if you do the, the similar calculation. You neglect the order, like D14 is the same as D41? I neglect the order, yeah. Absolutely. So UIJ, yeah, I've been a little bit sloppy. So UIJ equals UJI. And so DIJ equals DJI. So the. Um, Multiple zeta values are, are, can be written as periods in this um, strict cohomological sense. So the upshot is that um, MZVs, which were examples of periods we studied last time a little bit, so they are periods of um, certain spaces. So, so this. So say the zeta n1 to nr are periods of h n m0 n plus 3 delta, some space which can be defined in a very easy way. I may do it if I have time at the end, relative to some special divisor inside. Um, in other words, they're pairing, but you, that means you have a differential form, a, a Durham cohomology class in here. You have a, um, a Betty relative cycle given by, by blowing up the simplex in some way. And by pairing them together, you get uh, multiple zeta value. But now D is, not, is singular, so you... D is singular, yeah, but it's, it's smooth normal crossing. So 
so that's fine. When I define the DRAM cohomology, you, you have some, it, it, you have some simplicial complex, and you uh, you get it, you take the hyper cohomology of the associated triple complex. So it's not a problem to it is singular, but it's not a problem to define the DRAM cohomology. Yeah, I I gloss over that. Okay, so. Yeah, so I mean, so you can show by general theorems in mathematics that um, using here on Akers theorem that if you write a general integral of a, a differential form that's algebraic over blah blah blah, then you can decent you can you can uh, choose a nice compactification like this. But it won't be canonical. It will depend on some choices. And the point of what, we won't see this yet, but later on, the point is that in the physics case, we can do it um, canonically. We can do it explicitly and canonically. Because if, if you do it a different way, then you might find you get the, the cohomology that you get may be full of junk. And this will mean that you expect to see Galois conjugates of numbers that actually don't occur. So you want to do this in a, in a the minimal, cleanest way because the data of, of this geometry is going to f tell you about your period. Um, okay, so so what am I going to do next? Um, so the first stage was sort of as Thibault asked. We started off with with a period which was just an integral. Some, some integral that we're interested in, and we want to interpret it as um, coefficients in the pairing, in the Duram isomorphism, of some cohomology, some vector space, some vector spaces which, we, which were um, Betty and Duram cohomology of something. So, so far, we've, the cohomology is just a vector space. And um, the next stage is to explain that there's more structure going on here. In fact, there are filtrations on these vector spaces, and they carry what's called a mixed hot structure. And this is what will enable us to speak, to think about the weights of periods and and periods of different types. And then the next um, step up is to view these vector spaces not just as mixed hot structures, but as representations of a certain group. So um, what I want to do now, I'll start it before the break, is to explain to you what a, a mixed hot structure is. It's just some linear algebra um, structure um, on, on the cohomology, given by some filtrations. And then after that, I want to explain something about Tanakian categories and how we can then promote this to representations of a group. And then the point is that the, the group, this, this group will be a version of this Galois group I mentioned in the first lecture, and it will move um, the data of this differential form in this cycle around and will enable us to define Galois conjugates of, um, of, of the period. So that's, that's the plan. That's where we're headed. Um, no, there's no, ring, uh, there's no ring at this stage. Oh, it, the ring will, co will come in here. In the Tanakian category, you're allowed to take tensor products. Yes, yes. That, that will come in the, in the, the, the final step. Okay, so, um, ah. so I'll now give uh, a summary on a um, little bit of Hodge theory. I apologize to mathematicians who have seen this a hundred times. 
but I think it's good to give all the definitions. So, recap on mixed hot structures. Um, so, a pure um, Q hot structure of weight K is, actually, incidentally, I should say that this, we don't need the mixed hot structures to define, to, to we can go to the last step and um, from here to here without the mixed hot structures, but the reason I include it is because it's very useful to speak about weights and, and there's a lot of applications in physics that, for the notion of, of weight and so I think it's, it's important to emphasize it. Um, so Q hot structure of weight K is a finite dimensional vector space V of a Q um, with a decomposition of Vc, which is V tensor Qc, into types Vpq, so p where p plus q is equal to k. Um, satisfying VPQ equals VQP bar. So equivalently, um, you can say that VC has a decreasing filtration F. This is called the Hodge filtration, such that um, FP VC direct sum FK minus P plus one bar VC. Um, is isomorphic to the whole space. So the example to bear in mind here is, is differential forms with, with P uh, DZs and Q DZ bars. That's the prototype. And so to pass between these two definitions, um, then from the second definition to the first, you set P, P, Q, C is F P V C intersect F Q bar V C. And in the other direction, to pass from the first definition to the second, you set F P V C equals direct sum R greater than equal to P P R K minus R. So this is something like differential forms with at least um, P D, D, disease, at least P holomorphic components. So example, um, Q of minus N is the unique, well, is, is the hot structure, the following hot structure of weight 2n, so the vector space V in this case is, is just Q, it's one dimensional, and the Hodge filtration Fi um, Vc is uh, Vc if i is greater than or equal to n, sorry, less than or equal to n, of course, and it's zero if i is strictly bigger than n. 
So um, this means, um, so Q means uh, it's, the underlying vector space is Q, it's one dimensional. And the minus N is a notation, it's a take twist, it's a notation to tell you that you're, um, to keep track of the weights, you're in weight 2N. So it's not just a vector space, it's a vector space with, uh, with a weight. So it occurs in weight 2N. So this notation, I don't know where it originates from, but it's very, very standard. Um, so this is the Hodge structure of type n comma n. And so in fact Vc is isomorphic to Vcn comma n in this, time, in this case. And uh, you have not said what you call the type. Oh yeah, thank you. So the, the, the type, um, the type are the, the um, so HPQ is the dimension of VPQC and the Hodge numbers are these dimensions. So type NN means that the only non-vanishing Hodge number HPQ is zero unless um, P equals Q equals N. That's what it means to be of type NN. Thank you. And just before the break, so um, of course a classical theorem that if you take a smooth um, projective variety over Q, let's say, then the cohomology HKQ has a pure hot structure of weight K. Now perhaps I'll, I'll stop there and then continue after the break. Okay, so now a, a mixed hot structure. The, the what, sorry? The, the state of the state is this, yeah? Yes. For instance, I mean, I, okay, I have some vector space. From the definition, I think if I have any vector space, I yeah. think it's a trivial assigned for instruction. It's a canonical and functorial. So morphisms of varieties induce morphisms of hot structures. You should say natural. Okay, N yeah, a natural. These words are so abused in, okay. Yeah, otherwise you could put the, the sort of trivial hot structure on everything, it wouldn't be very interesting. No, no, of course, of course, yeah. Um, a mixed Hodge structure um, is a finite dimensional vector space V over Q again, so there's a Q, a Q mixed Hodge structure um, with one, an increasing filtration W dot V on V, which is called the weight filtration. And a decreasing filtration F dot V C on V C, again called the Hodge filtration, um, such that the associated weight graded pieces of V, so this is WK over WK minus one V, um, equipped with the filtrate, the Hodge filtration on its complexification, mm, defines a pure Hodge structure of weight K. Okay, and the, the key theorem is due to Deligne, and that in particular the sorts of groups we're interested in, the relative cohomology, singular relative cohomology, has a canonical and functorial mixed hot structure. 
Then the next key point, which is very important, but I will become clear in a minute why it's important, that the category of mixed hot structures um, is an abelian category. So you have kernels and co-kernels. Um, and you can also take um, tensor products, tensor products of mixed hot structures and duals. So why that's important will become clear later on. A definition that's important um, and very relevant for physics is that a mixed hot structure is mixed tate um, if graded vk is zero um, if k is odd and graded weight kv is a direct sum of Tate uh, hot structures of weight k if k equals 2r. And all the examples we saw were of this type. So why is this important? It's because um, so the, the philosophy is that um, the periods of cohomology which are mixed tate um, should be very special and they are things like multiple zeta values and polylogarithms are all of this type. Sorry, is it the definition of mixed tate or you, you assume that you know what it is? This is a definition. Um, okay, so that's it for uh, Mix Hodge theory. Okay, so now, um, so we've promoted the cohomology to a mixed hot structure by adding these filtrations. And then now we want to put uh, a group action in. So for this, I need uh, a reminder on Tanakian categories. I'm not going to give the full details because it's very tedious. And um, so the idea of a Tanakian category is that it formalizes the, um, the, the categories which occur as representations of groups. So as you know, if you have representations of a group, you can take direct sums, you can take tensor products of representations, you can take duals. And so the axioms of a Tanakian category formalize what um, the properties satisfied by categories of representations of groups. And the game is the following, that you think of a group a finite group or a, an algebraic matrix group, and you give me the category of its representations, and then I will then reconstruct the group and give you back your group. So that's, that's, the, that's exactly what's going on. Yes, yes. Um, so here's the setup. So you, you have to be a bit patient with all these uh, axioms, and I'm not going to give the, the full glory, but think in your mind of the representations of a group. So k is a field of characteristic 0. And uh, we start off with t, a k linear um, category. Oh, I might as well make it a billion straight off. So k linear means that it's the homomorphisms are k vector spaces, and the composition of morphisms is k bilinear. Then t is what is called a neutral Tanakian category. If um, if it also has 
Okay, so I said you could take tensor products of representations. So the first thing is a tensor product. Tensor T cross T to T, which technically is a bilinear bifunctor. Um, it has a unit. So I think of this as the trivial representation. Um, and some extra data given by natural isomorphisms of the form A tensor B is isomorphic to B tensor A. Um, A tensor B tensor C is isomorphic to A tensor B tensor C. You know, 1 tensor A and so on and so forth, and I spare you the details. And they satisfy a bunch of axioms, which you can imagine. It also has a duality. So this is a um, contravariant functor from T to the opposite category, um, which we denote by M goes to M dual. That's satisfies all sorts of compatibilities with the previous data. And um, the most important thing, which I'll put here, is what is called a fiber functor. So this is an exact faithful tensor functor. Um, omega from the category to vector spaces over the field. So in the case of the representation of a group, this is just the functor forget the group action. So you have a vector space with a group acting on it. You just forget the group action and you get a vector space. So the first time you see this, it looks a bit silly, but it's very important. And so such that, so being a tensor functor means that um, omega A tensor B is isomorphic to omega A tensor omega B. Omega 1 is isomorphic to the, the vector space of one dimension 1K, and so on and so forth. And there's a whole list of axioms and compatibilities between these axioms that I don't want to write. Yes, but do uh, uh, everybody, does everybody agree on the definition of Tanakian category? Because at the beginning, Sa Saavedra had various... Uh, this is Saavedra's definition, it's correct. It's, it's, a, it's because it's a neutral Tanakian category. So this is, yeah, I should have said, this is due to Saavedra. And if you're paranoid, you can check that it follows that N1 is isomorphic to K. But it follows from the axioms. So that was the missing thing that works when you can, when that fails if you try to consider a non-neutral Tanakian category. In this case, it's, it's the definition of Saavedra and it works fine. That's all we need. Okay, so the main theorem is that from there, that in fact, any category like this is the category of representations of a group. So um, what it means is that there is an affine group scheme that I call, I'm going to call G omega. It's technically defined to be the tensor automorphisms of the fiber functor omega. I'll explain what that means. And the map from T to, sorry, to representations. So this is the category of finite, of finite dimensional representations of G. And the map is just M goes to omega m. 
and such that sorry such that such that this map is an equivalence equivalence of categories. So the the upshot is whenever you have any category satisfying the axioms that would lead you to think that it might possibly be the category of representations of a group, then indeed there is a group such that it is the category of representations of that group. You mean finite dimensional? Here, finite dimensional. And here also the omega is values in Oh yeah, for me VEC is finite dimensional. For me VEC is, is finite dimensional always. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so what is phi? Um, so, so what is this group? So let me describe its points. So, so you exclude non-compact group immediately? Your if you want unity representation of non-compact groups, say infinite dimensional. Sorry. Um, so you can extend this to infinite dimensional rep representations by taking inductive limits. There's no problem. And the theorem is then Um Yeah, I believe so. Um, so if phi is, oh, well, yeah, no, if your representations are, are limits of finite dimensional representations, then yes. Um, so if phi is ought, is a, a, a point in this group, so R here will be some, a commutative, unitary k algebra, then how do we, in fact the, this group is just the biggest possible group, it's got to act on these vector spaces, so it's going it to be the biggest possible group which acts on all these vector spaces simultaneously and preserves all the structures. So um, phi is given by an element phi m in G L omega M uh, subscript R, this means tensor with R for all objects such that um, so if we have if we have two objects M and N in T and a morphism from M to N then the following diagram commutes. So this is phi m and phi n. I really should put an r in here, but I won't bother. <coughs> so for, for, every, for every morphism between two objects, m and n and t, we get a, a commutative diagram. And then there's the, the, the data of the tensor product, so we need so for any two objects, so I should put little r's everywhere. Oh, sorry, this is uh, phi m tensor phi n, and this is phi m tensor n. So the tensor product of, so in other words, this, this, this collection of matrices respects the tensor product. So this is um, not such a helpful way to, to think about the, um, the Tanaka group. But the Tanaka group is something slightly mysterious because it, um, um, the, how do you specify an element of the group at this, uh, in the R points of the group? Well, you have to specify um, uh, um, an automorphism for every vector space, for every possible object in your category. So it's an infinite amount of data. So what's a much better way to think about the Tanaka group is um, its dual, its, its functions. So the better thing to do is to construct the functions on the group um, 
for something called matrix coefficients. So the functions on a group is a, forms a Hopf algebra. And so we want to write down some Hopf algebra from, from uh, a Tanakian category. So definition. A matrix coefficient, um, or sometimes called a framed object, of a Tanakian category T is a triple consisting of an object in T and V in omega M and F in omega M dual. <clears throat> so let, so this is, we're going to think of, this is very, so in the back of your mind you should think of, you know, the cohomology of something and differential form and domain of integration. So this triple defines, um, is this, this is the data which allows you to define an integral and hence a period. And um, this, as we'll see in a minute, should be, uh, is very close to this idea. So we should keep this in mind. So let P omega omega denote a K vector space um, spanned by the symbols M V F modulo the following relations, which are going to be analogous to relations which you know to occur for, for integrals. So the first relation is linearity. Um, and that's that if I take m lambda 1 plus lambda 2 v2 f, this is equivalent to lambda 1 m1 v1 f plus lambda 2 m v2 f. So to pursue this analogy with integrals, we know that integrals are certainly linear in, um, in, in the arguments, in, in the differential forms, and also in terms of the domains of integration. So the other, so of course by symmetry we have another linearity relation. So this is for all lambda 1. Okay, and then we need a um, another relation which corresponds to um, changes of variables on integrals. So to for every morphism. M to M prime, uh, alpha, let's say, um, there is an equivalence. M V F is equivalent to M prime V prime F prime if um, V prime equals omega of alpha V and um, F equals omega alpha transpose of F prime. So we have omega M, M prime, we have a map omega alpha, and the transpose goes in the opposite direction on the duals. Okay. So denote the equivalence class by square brackets M, V, F. And if I want to be pedantic, I'll put a little omega, comma, omega in the, in 
is a superscript, which reminds me that V is in um, omega of M and F is in omega dual of M. But I will sometimes drop this out of laziness. So that defines a, we have a vector space of symbols and relations. There's a product on this, which is M V F multiplied by M prime V prime F prime, and that's M tensor M prime V tensor V prime F tensor F prime. And it is well defined. And there is a coproduct Um, so it's a map from P omega omega to P omega omega tensor P omega omega. And the formula, which will be absolutely crucial for what happens next, is simply the sum M E dual. Tensor M E I F. So here the sum is over E I basis of omega M. And so E I dual is the dual basis. And if you don't like the choice of basis, well, it's clear that this doesn't depend on the choice of basis, but of course, the element EI Chech tensor EI is the representative of the identity in HOM omega M omega M, which is omega M Chech. OK. So we have some abstract. Algebra of symbols, modular relations. And from that, we define the, uh, the Tanaka group. Um, in fact, the definition of the Tanaka group. So this is the P omega omega is the affine ring of this um, Tanaka group. Um, in other words, what this means is for all our commutative unitary K algebra, take K itself if you prefer, then the group, the, the, the R value points of the group is given by the homomorphisms from homomorphisms of rings from this ring to the ring R. And the, the group law on G is, is encapsulated by this coproduct. But the key remark um, is that it is not the group um, the key remark is that it's the functions on the group which is the more fundamental object. Not the group itself. If I want to specify an element of the group, I have to know how to map every matrix coefficient into R. But the point is that when we, when we do this Feynman game and, and can look at integrals, we only work with a, a finite um, subspace of this space, and we can do computations. If you work with a group, you have it's some, some infinite data that goes into defining an element of the group. OK, so now a variant. And then we'll be near the end of the technicalities. So a different situation is when we have two fiber functors. Omega and omega prime to finite dimensional vector spaces over K. And then I can define P omega omega prime 
to be the linear span of symbols MVF exactly as before, but this time V is in omega of M for the first fiber functor and F is in the dual of the uh, image of M under the second fiber functor and we take modulo exactly the same relations as before. So linearity and equivalence is, uh, is defined in, in an identical way. And now we don't get a, um, a co-product, we get a co-action. We have delta Um, which is given by the same formula. I'll, I think I'll, I'll write it out again. Do you mean omega prime and omega prime in the second one? No. Omega goes from omega, omega prime to omega, 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 omega prime. So I, I will write it out. Sorry, I can't understand something. So uh, omega maps uh, abstract category T yes. to explicit representation of a group. Yes. Right? But then you say, so category, abstract category uniquely defines a group. Yes. So if, I mean, I have feelings that omega is somehow unique up to some of them. Of course. So why do you need omega and omega prime which are different? Uh, in what sense are they different? Um, to give me more flexibility. And the reason I need omega and omega prime to be different, because one will be Duram, Duram functor, and the other will be Betty functor. And uh, I cannot define a period out of two differential forms. If you give me a differential form and another differential form, sometimes I can, but in general I cannot define a number. But if you give me a differential form, which is in Duram, and you give me um, a cycle, a homology cycle, then I can integrate and I get a number. So when we think about periods, it's crucial that we have two different fiber functors. And so that will come in, uh, in, in a moment. So the, the formula here, um, let, let me put sigma to, to differ from the previous case, is now sum um, m. So if I'm going to be pedantic, I should put omega, omega prime, m, v, e, i, chech, omega, omega, tensor m, E i sigma. So you see that the, the sigma um, occurs here, so it must be an omega prime up here. And it's as before. And so how to think about this, this is a, 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 a coaction to O by definition to the functions on the group. And so this is, a, this is equivalent to an action of G omega on P omega omega prime. So we'll think of P omega omega prime as some sort of ring of periods. And um, purely formally, we get a group that's going to act on it. So let me do that now. Okay, so long last um, metallic periods. So now I'm going to take T. There are many choices for T, but the bare minimum that one needs, actually it's not the, the strict bare minimum, but the bare minimum that I need, will be the following category of triples. VB, VDR, and C, where
VB is a finite dimensional vector space over Q. So here, here K equals Q. And it has an increasing filtration, the weight filtration W, called the weight filtration. We have another Q vector space called V Duran with also an increasing filtration called the weight and a decreasing filtration called the Hodge filtration, both defined over Q this time. And C is a comparison isomorphism. C is an isomorphism from V Duram tensor C to V Betty tensor C such that it preserves the weight filtration. And such that um, the vector, the Betty vector space V equipped with uh, the weight filtration and the image of the Hodge filtration on its complexification is a mixed hot structure. So those are the objects in the category. They're triples um, of pairs of vector spaces and which are isomorphic after tensioning with C. And the morphisms are the morphisms of these objects which respect this data. So this category, oh sorry, this should be, um, I want to call this category H. Let's call this category H for Hodge or something. <clears throat> so um, H is a Tanakian category. So the proof of this fact is due to Deline. Um, and it has two fiber functors. Um, omega Betty or Duram, which goes from this category to vector spaces of Q. And to a vector space, we associate either VB or DR, depending on which fiber functor we are looking at. So at long last, we can define an abstract ring of periods. So PMH is going to be defined to be P omega Duram omega Betty in H. So I like to write sort of as a mnemonic M for the pair omega Duram, omega Betty. And I, I write dr for the pair omega Duram, omega Duram. <clears throat> so we have um, a ring. So we call this, I don't know what to call it, maybe the ring of H periods. Um, and we get a group. So we get G, Duram, or Betty. We get two groups, in fact. We can take spec of P omega omega, where the dot equals Duram or Betty. So we get two groups um, acting on this, this, uh, this ring. In fact, I never got, I'm, I, I prefer to think about Duram, so actually let's um, let, let's scrap that. Um, so we'll just have one group. And um, so what do we have, as advertised in the first lecture? So the elements of this ring of this ring of periods are equivalence classes 
m v sigma m, where m is a triple uh, consisting of two vector spaces and a comparison isomorphism. V is in m Duram and sigma in m Betty dual. So we have an abstract ring. It has a period homomorphism to complex numbers. Um, so what it does is it takes a triple and it maps to. So what can you do here? We, we have V. We have um, V is in M Duram. And then we have the data tells us that after tensing with C, we can send that into V Betty. So C V is in M V tensor C. And sigma is in, we can view it as in the dual. So then we can pair these two things together. We have an element in a vector space and an element in its dual. And we denote the pairing by this. And that's a complex number. So what have we gained is that we have a, in inverted commas, a Galois action. So it's not much to do with Galois for now, but it's, it's, that's how we want to think of it. So we have this affine group scheme, G de Ram, which acts on this ring of H periods. So we have some types of numbers. And um, so there would be analogous action if I looked at the Betty group, but I'm not going to. What else do we have? We have a weight filtration. Um, so we can talk about the weight of an H of a period uh, of an element of this ring. So the elements of weight less than n is, the, is an element of the vector space spanned by these equivalence classes where v, the differential form, if you like, is of weight at most n. So we have an abstract ring with lots of properties. And of course, some of these are not in fact, you can write, this map will actually be surjective. You can write any complex number as a period of a random mixed hot structure. It's not very interesting. So the remark is that this ring is too big um, because not all of the objects in H come from geometry. So they're not periods to start off with. But we will only, the point is, that the key point, is that we will only, we shall only consider examples of the form or elements which actually come from geometry and are hence periods in the sense which I described earlier. So the objects will be equivalence classes of H. Um, Betty, uh, Betty sorry, elements in H of this form and with the, compa the canonical comparison, which is given by integration. And so we get uh, periods of the form. So th this, this comes from geometry. 
and it indeed defines a period. Yes, but when you define your uh, ring, you yes. have, of course, relations. And yes. the relations hold uh, in non-geometric case. So when you take only geometric generators, yes. are uh, your relations still uh, the same? So uh, I will come to that. So, um, OK, so the, the, word, the word that I'm not saying yet is, is a motive. And so the way people normally set up such a try to think about periods is by defining some category of motives. And we, we don't have a good definition of a Tanakhian category of motives. But the, here's the key point, that any reasonable definition of mixed motives, so that means you're only considering cohomology of algebraic varieties with some relations given by <coughs> certain sort of standard exact sequences between cohomology. So let's suppose that there existed such um, a abelian or Tanakian category of mixed motives over Q. Um, so any one of the things you would like when you have such a category is you would like to have a functor from mixed motives over Q to this category H. So a motive should have a Betty realization and a Dram realization. That's one of the bare minimum requirements. And, and, and it should have, this, this should be um, an example of an object in MMQ. So it, if, if you have, um, and it's also it's expected, so we get a map, we get a, a, a linear map from the, the motivic periods. So this would be motivic periods in the, in the true sense of the word where you had a category of motives, and it would map into this slightly more naive um, version, this ring of H periods. And one of the things that you would like about the category of motives is that this, that the, this functor should be fully faithful, and that would imply that this is injective. So that would answer your question, that there should be no new relations here that you can't actually lift to, to geometry. And that the key point of this, which... Um, which is maybe not obvious the first time you think about this, is that if, if you give me a category of mixed motives, all these constructions that we're going to play with in this category H, we can immediately lift them to, to MM. Um, what that means is that we're going to have, we can define the analogous ring of periods in this category, and it's going to have a ring structure, and it's going to have a, um, a coaction, in exactly the same way, um, but the point is that this diagram, where I work in this elementary and naive category H, is going to give me exactly the same answer. So if you play this same Tanakian machine applied to the uh, true category of motives, for your coaction, you will get exactly the same formula as the one I wrote down before. So this diagram commutes. And if, if you have um, a period here that comes from geometry, and if you could lift it to this cat uh, Tanakian category of motives, then when we compute the, um, the, the true motivic Galois action up here, it will give exactly the same answer as if we calculate it in this category H. So what could happen is, um, that if, if you give me a, a, a nice abelian cat Tanakian category of motives, everything we do here, we can immediately lift to this and do it on the level of, of actual motives. But if it turns out that your category of motives does not have an injective map from here to here, then it's simply the wrong thing to do. And what remains is, is this game, which works. What are the present category of motives for which I know this answer, the injectivity? Um, so examples. The, the examples where you know this are mixed tape motives over um, where OS is the S units in a ring of integers in OK, where K is a number field. That's essentially the unique case where, where we have the, the, the correct definition of mixed motives. There's, it's not clear. You can construct some toy categories of motives, but it will gain, we will gain absolutely nothing by doing that. And um, 
so uh, by this, this uh, reasoning, um, it's perfectly good to work here. So in some sense, we completely circumvent all these conjectures on motives. Um, so what do you mean exactly by geometry here? Arithmetic geometry? So yeah, I will only cons um, so a motivic period will be um, will be the um, so let's put it here. A motivic period for me will be an element in this ring. So I'm, I, in my head, I'm, I want to think of it up here, but we don't have such a category. So I'll, I'll view its image down here of the form psi equals um, something like this. So it's h. Um, this will cover all the examples that we need. And some differential form and some Betty cycle. So again, x is any quasi correctly. Any, yeah, so I had um, smooth, um, smooth scheme over Q. Yeah, smooth quasi-projective scheme over Q. And Z will be uh, a simple normal crossing divisor in X, all defined over Q. That will be enough. And so the, the, the subtlety here is that if you give me two different, um, two different ways of writing a given number as a period of cohomology, then I have a problem. I have to show that they define the same metric period. But that's an inevitable problem because if you write, you can write different integral representations for a given number and you don't, don't necessarily know how to prove that they're the same. But the point is that in this category, this category is much more flexible. It's much easier to prove um, relations here than it is up here. And up here you tie your hands. You say we're only allowed to use certain types of algebraic operations and it's very restrictive. So for all those reasons, um, we work in this category H, and it gives, um, it gives the right answer. It will give the correct um, Galois action. Did we see that the period is a ring here, that we can multiply them? Um, Where did we see that? Uh, yes, here. So here we take the... the Here's a, um, a, a triple and equivalence class. We multiply two together. That's the, def that's the formula for the product. And the, the period of this times the period of this equals the period of that. So at, at long last, um, examples. So um, because of clashes of notation, normally I think of these, the following examples in a true Dijkmakian category of motives. But because in this case it injects into PMH, I'm certainly allowed to identify um, elements with that image. So it's a tiny abuse of notation. It's not very drastic. So the first example that we saw was 2 pi i. Left shirt's motive. So this was H1 P1 minus 0 infinity. Um, with a differential form dx over x and well, what I called gamma naught, which is a loop around 1, uh, 0, sorry. So this, what is this H1? It's, it's, it's the Tate motive. Q of minus 1. It's in weight 2, and it's of type 1, 1. And so the period of Lm was given by the integral of dx over x along gamma naught, and it's 2 pi i. So Lm is the motivic version so it, it lifts the number 2 pi i, and sorry? N on the right hand side. N? It's okay, okay. So the Galois action, well, we have um, G Duram is some huge group. We don't know what the group is, but how, how could it act on this thing? 
Well, this is a one-dimensional vector space. So the only way it could act is by it act, a, a linear map on a one-dimensional vector space is just multiplication. There's no thing, no, nothing else it could be. So um, how does an element act on this number, on this metric period? GLM is going to be some rational number times LM. Let me look at Q points. So I think I gave this formula. These groups, the Q points, are always a risky dense. Uh, these groups are uh, essentially extension of tori by uh, unipo uh, pro unipotent groups. Or? No, it's an extension of a pro reductive group mm -hmm. by a pro unipotent group. Yes. It has a, a pro reductive quotient. So here we see that because G gives a map. So we think of lambda as a map from GDR to GM. It's a homomorphism. So there, we've computed the, the, uh, the action of the Galois group on 2 pi i. And the other example I gave was the logarithm. So let's do the logarithm. So, yeah, so, yeah, exactly. So, um, another way to say it is that, so let's take omega Duram. So, the definition of the Tanaka group is that we take the, the we apply, take a fiber functor, which is in this case the Duram, of what I wrote by abuse of notation as this one. I mean, really, the triple of Betty and Duram. So, this is just omega 1 Duram. P1 minus 0 infinity, which as a, as a hot structure is Q of minus 1, but as a vector space, it's just the vector space Q. And so we get, um, um, so for element G here, we have omega G is a map from Q to Q. So what it does is, is um, uh, this differential form, as you say, G of, so omega Duram of G of dx over x, it, what it does is it scales the differential form by a number. And therefore it scales the integral by a rational number. How do you see that the character of lambda is non-trivial? Um, because the period is non-trivial. You could also use um, weight arguments, but it's, um, because if it was trivial, this would be the trivial representation. And by the Tanakian equivalence, we have om omega maps a Tanakian category to vec q is an equivalence. So if, if this was the, zero, the trivial representation, it would be the zero object. And therefore, it would be the zero object as a mixed hot structure. But it can't be because it has a period that's non-trivial. Well, no, it can't be because it can't be because it has has weight uh, has weight too. That's what I mean to say. Yeah. Okay, so I'll try and finish very soon. So the next example is the logarithm. So two. Um, so the Mativic logarithm with the same. Um, alpha I had before, so alpha was in Q alpha bigger than 1. So it's the triple, I just write this H1 and then it was, the differential form was dx over x and then the path was gamma 1. Gamma 1, if you remember, was a path from 1 to alpha. Um, and so this, this thing here is called the Kummer motif, K alpha. And in fact, it sits in an exact sequence. Um, of mixed, well, these pure hot structures, it's a mixed hot structure. And um, the period of log M alpha w was by definition the integral of dx over x along gamma, 
and now is log of alpha. So this is the Mativic version of the logarithm. Let me give the Galois action. So how does the how does the Tanaka group act? Well, it the, the Tanaka group acts on the um, Duram realization of this thing in such a way that it preserves the image of this sub thing and it maps to the quotient um, and gives the action on Q of minus one, which you've already computed. So um, the, the Tanaka group will act here um, in, a, in a trivial way and here by um, this character lambda g. So g of log um, um, alpha is going to be um, oh let me just put alpha as a prime just for psychological reasons then this is going to be log g of p plus I think I called it new p last time and q so here g is in So that's how the Galois group acts on, on log of a prime number. New P of G, yes. I beg your pardon? New P of G. Uh, oh yeah, new P of G, sorry, yeah, new P. Um, uh, i put it in brackets, new P of G. Yeah, so, so this, I, I did all this, I gave examples last time, but we didn't really understand where they came from. But so now, um, um, so I called this a representation rho last time. G Duram, Q, let's say, to um, GL2, and G maps to, um, well, last time I think I wrote it the wrong way around, but I'll do the same. There, so it gives a, a, a representation of this. Um, group on GL2. And so why GL2? Because it acts on the Duram realization of this. And so GL2 we think of as GL2 is um, GL omega Duram of H blah, which is equal to GL of H1 Duram P1 minus zero infinity relative to 1 alpha. And as I explained earlier, this was a, recall that this was a two-dimensional vector space spanned by the two differential forms. So that's why we get a two-dimensional representation. And that means that the, the, the worst thing that can happen to a logarithm when we hit it with the Tivik Galois group is that it's going to pick up a period of this integral, which is a rational number. So, sorry? Uh, well, yeah. Here you mean that you see that each uh, number is a product of two primes and up will get the sum? Yes, because there's a functional equation, there's a relation here, that, uh, which is the functional equation of the logarithm, that of course at log, um, log m a b equals log m a plus log m b. So if you like, for every prime number, I get a new degree of freedom. I get a new map from G to rational numbers. But to understand that, what do you need to do to have uh, uh, another algebraic geometry which include the two structures to see that they need to be compatible in a way? Or, uh... how, how do you mean? I don't understand the, the question. Uh, but probably it means you have, you have this uh, uh, motif with alpha. And you have at some moment to you go to compare the motif corresponding to p to q and to p times q. Exactly. So you have to do a little bit of you have to do a little bit of geometry. Um, it's not it's not very difficult. It's a nice exercise. And you have to check. So you have to look at the, what's the definition of, of this equivalence. It means that to show that two. So you've got to write log a b as as a period, and log this as a period of something else. And you've got to construct a morphism of mixed hot structures. Such that the um, such that the the differential forms match up and the integration domains match up. So in practice, that means you have to write this integral and these the sum of integrals and find an algebraic change of variables 
which sends one onto the other. This kind of thing that has to be done in practice is always done in the literature. <laughs> oh, this. Oh, um, um, of course not. No, yeah, I think so. Well, I don't know. There are gaps, of course. Um, no, but this is, um, there are many ways to do this. No, he of course it's very easy, but... Uh, in, in but, th but this is the point that, no, in general, it's not the case. So, if you, if, so here's an example um, where I've been dishonest. So I'll, 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 I'll confess to my dishonesty, and I want to define the motivic multiple zeta value. Just for psychological reason, it's good to see the definition, or a definition, I should say. So I, I define this space in the case, this moduli space for, in the case n equals 2, for zeta 2. Um, so, so this is the motivic mzv. So I say this because I gave all these formulae last time for the, the Galois action. Um, so here n r is greater than or equal to 2, and n is the weight, it's the sum of the indices. Omega is, is the form you get, the, the relevant form on this moduli space that was obtained from the integral representation I gave earlier for the multiple zeta values. And x is, is, the, is the analog, the higher dimensional analog of what I call pi inverse sigma in, in the example when n equals 2. So this gives you a metric multiple zeta value, but you have to be and the period And r equals zeta n1 up to nr. Um, but then here, so here's a caveat. So there's another definition of motivic multiple zeta values. So the usual definition involves a different geometry, involves the motivic fundamental group of p1 minus 3 points. So I, we have two different definitions of a motivic multiple zeta value. And we, we expect them to be the same, but actually it's not known. Expect this to give the same motivic period. That means function. That means element of this ring. So this is viewed in P and H. So this is an example where we have two different ways of compactifying. Um, the space, doing these blow-ups to make it all nice. Uh, actually, they're extremely close to each other, so I have no doubt whatsoever that this is doable, but you have to do something. And for example, all the combinatorial relations that are in the literature for multi-data values have been checked by some people uh, to be in uh, the two cents that you are... In these two senses? Oh, um, not even in... Um, no, there are relations which are not known to be motivic in, in, in either sense. I can't think of an example, but um, yeah, there are some. Not everything is known to be motivic. Well, when you define such a character like lambda and up, you know that they are all independent, it's like no algebraic equation whatsoever, or you, you um, may miss some at some point. Um, so that's the thing. So that so um, um, what can I say? So the so that, that's a, a, essentially a question about um, um, independence of these motivic periods. Can we, can we verify that there are no relations? So here, here the, the relations between the news come from a relation. So how can we check that such a relation cannot occur? And, um, and that's quite easy to do in, um, in practice in these situations because we have, um, weight, we have all these structure. We have the weight filtrations. We have this group action. So it's not very difficult to, to, to show independence. So here's an example, maybe to illustrate, example, um, zeta motivic 5, special case of this, um, because of, um, so in, in this case, in the Tate case, the weight is in fact a grading, so we can speak of the weight. This is of weight 5 as an mzv, the mzv weight, but, um, it's actually weights 10 in the Hodge theoretic weight. So it's in corresponds to something of type um, 5, 5. And then you take the number 1 in this ring, which is a weight 0. And so because this is a weight 5 and this is a weight 0, we deduce automatically that 
um, they're linear independent. So if alpha zeta 5 plus beta equals 0, then that implies alpha beta equals 0. Whereas for, for actual numbers, it is still an unsolved problem. It is not known whether zeta 5 is irrational. So in this setting, it's transcendence questions are very easy because you have all this structure. So in practice, if you want to prove that two numbers are, are linearly independent in this ring, um, you can do it quite easily. Yeah, and there's no way to go back. <laughs> no. <laughs> to actual numbers, no. <laughs> but, but in some sense, yes. no, but in some sense, it's not a, it's a good question because, um, because you need to understand the relations in this ring before you can even attempt to understand the relations as actual numbers. Because if there was a relation in this ring, you'd apply the period, you get a relation in actual numbers. So before you can even think about transcendence questions, you need to know what you're supposed to prove, which, which numbers are independent and which numbers are not independent. So you first have to understand independence in this ring first. And so I, I think that it's, it's necessary to understand this before one can do transcendence questions. OK, so that was the technical bit done. Next week will be entirely graph polynomials and, and physic, more physics-y. Thank you. <clears throat>